More than a year ago, this subcommittee launched an investigation into digital markets. Our two objectives have been to document competition problems in the digital economy and to evaluate whether the current antitrust framework is able to properly address them. In September 2019, the chairman and ranking members of the full committee and the subcommittee issued sweeping bipartisan requests for information to the four firms that will testify at today's hearing. Since then, we've received millions of pages of evidence from these firms, as well as documents and submissions from more than 100 market participants. We also conducted hundreds of hours of interviews. As part of this investigation, we have held five hearings to examine the effects of online market power on innovation and entrepreneurship, data privacy, a free and diverse press, and independent businesses in the online marketplace. We've held 17 briefings and roundtables with over 35 experts and stakeholders in support of our work. Google is the world's largest online search engine, capturing more than 90% of searches online. It controls key technologies and digital ad markets and enjoys more than a billion users across six products, including browsers, smartphones, and digital maps. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, these corporations already stood out as titans in our economy. In the wake of COVID-19, however, they're likely to emerge stronger and more powerful than ever before. As gatekeepers of the digital economy, these platforms enjoy the power to pick winners and losers, to shake down small businesses, and enrich themselves while choking off competitors. Their ability to dictate terms, call the shots, upend entire sectors, and inspire fear represent the powers of a private government. Our founders would not bow before a king, nor should we bow before the emperors of the online economy. Mr. Bachai, over 85% of all online searches go through Google. Every online company in the United States depends on Google to reach users. A business may sink or swim based on Google's decisions alone. Numerous online businesses told us that Google steals their content and privileges its own sites in ways that profit Google but crush everyone else. Most businesses asked to stay anonymous due to fears that Google would retaliate against them. One entrepreneur, Brian Warner, told us his website was thriving until Google stole his content. After Google's decision, traffic to his website dropped by 80%. He had to downsize his business and lay off half his staff. He told us, and I quote, if someone came to me with an idea for a website or a web service today, I'd tell them to run, run as far away from the web as possible, launch a lawn care business or dog grooming business, something Google can't take away as soon as he or she is thriving. So my first question, Mr. Bichai, is why does Google steal content from honest businesses? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect, uh, I disagree with that characterization. Just last week, I met with many small businesses. In fact, today we support 1.4 million small businesses, supporting over $385 billion in economic activity. We see many businesses thrive, particularly even during the pandemic. Businesses, an example, Kettle Kings in Texas, which sells kettlebells, they've really Mr. Bichai, expanded. I have a limited amount of time, so I don't want to interrupt you, but my question is very specific. We heard throughout this investigation that Google has stolen content to build your own business. These are consistent reports. And so uh, it, your, your testimony that that doesn't happen is really inconsistent with what we've learned during the course of the investigation. But, but I'll move on to a, to a new question. Uh, Mr. Pichai, most Americans believe that when they enter a search query that what Google shows are the most relevant results. But increasingly, Google just shows whatever is most profitable for Google, be it Google Ads or Google's own sites. And so my question, Mr. Pichai, isn't there a fundamental conflict of interest between serving users who want to access the best and most relevant information and Google's business model, which incentivizes Google to sell ads and keep users on Google's own sites? We have always focused on providing users the most relevant information, and we rely on the trust for users to come back to Google every day. In fact, a vast majority of uh, queries in Google, we don't show ads at all. And we show ads only for a small subset of queries where the intent from users is highly commercial. For example, they may be looking for something like TV sets or so on. But Mr. Bichai, so, what, is the, what is the value of the part that you do use the Google ads for? I mean, it's a substantial part of your business. What's the, what's the actual uh, value, 200 billion, 300 billion? Uh, uh, you know, in terms of revenue, uh, it's around 100, 100 plus billion dollars. Okay. But uh, that's you know, a lot of money, Mr. Bichai. Let, let me move on. Uh, 
it really, Mr. Bachai, it's Google's business model that is the problem. Our documents show that Google evolved from a turnstile to the rest of the web to a walled garden that increasingly keeps users within its sites. Emails show that over a decade ago, Google started to fear competition from certain websites, web pages that could divert search traffic and revenue from Google. These documents show that Google staff discussed the proliferating threat, is how it was described, that these web pages posed to Google. Any traffic loss to other sites was a loss in revenue. One of Google's memos observed that certain websites were getting, and I quote, too much traffic. So Google decided to put an end to that. Mr. Bachaya, you've been at Google since 2004. Were you involved in these discussions about the threat from vertical search? Uh, Congressman, uh, without knowing the specifics, it's uh, you know uh, I'm not fully clear of the context. But definitely, when we look at vertical searches, it validates the competition we see. For example, when users come looking to shop online, independent studies show that over 55% of product searches originate with Amazon and over 70% originate with the major e-commerce companies. In the few categories which are commercial in nature, we see vigorous competition, be it travel, be it real estate, and, and we are working hard, focused well, Let me on ask very specifically, Mr. Chai. The evidence that we collected shows that Google pursued a multi-pronged attack. First, Google began to steal other web pages' content. For example, in 2010, Google stole restaurant reviews from Yelp to bootstrap its own rival local search business. Mr. Pichai, do you know how Google responded when Yelp asked you to stop stealing their reviews? Well, I'll tell you. Our investigation shows that Google's response was to threaten to delist Yelp entirely. In other words, the choice Google gave Yelp was let us steal your content or effectively disappear from the web. Mr. Pichai, isn't that anti-competitive? Congressman, uh you know, when I run the company, I'm really focused on giving users what they want. We conduct ourselves to the highest standard. Happy to engage, understand the specifics, and, and answer your questions further. Thank you. And just one final series of questions, Mr. Bajai. Did Google ever use its surveillance over web traffic to identify competitive threats? Uh, Congressman, just like other businesses, we try to understand trends from, uh, you know, uh, data which we can see and we use it to improve our products for our users, uh, but we are really focused on improving our products, and that's how uh, search works. I appreciate works. that, Mr. Pichai. Google's own documents and numerous interviews with companies affected by this conduct show that Google did just that, uh, which is very disturbing and very anti-competitive. In addition to stealing content, Google also began to privilege its own sites. An investigative report published just yesterday found that 63% of web searches that start on Google also end somewhere on Google's own websites. And to me, that's evidence that Google is increasingly a walled garden which keeps users on Google sites, even if Google doesn't have the most relevant information and it's economically catastrophic for other companies online. And so uh, my time is running out, but Mr. Bachai, I'll just end by saying the evidence seems very clear to me. As Google became the gateway to the internet, it began to abuse its power. It used its surveillance over web traffic to identify competitive threats and crush them. It has dampened innovation and new business growth, and it's dramatically increased the price of accessing users on the internet, virtually ensuring that any business that wants to be found on the web must pay Google a tax. Mr. Pichai, during your, our field hearing in my home state of Colorado, I heard a story that sounded so brazen and contrary to free market principles that I thought it must have been straight from the Chinese Communist Party's corporate espionage playbook. Google took advantage of a company that relied on your search engine to build its brand and compete. Google misappropriated lyrics from Genius Media Group's website and published those lyrics on Google's own platform. However, Genius caught Google in the act, quite literally red-handed. When Google, when Genius suspected this corporate theft was occurring, the company incorporated a digital watermark in its lyrics that spelled out red-handed. In Morse code, Google's lyric boxes contained the watermark, showing that your company stole what you couldn't or didn't want to produce yourself. After Google executives stated that they were investigating this problematic behavior, Genius created another experiment to determine the scope of the misappropriation. It turns out that out of 271 songs where the watermark was applied, 43% showed clear evidence of matching. Your company, which advertises itself as a doorway to freedom, took advantage of this small company, all but extinguishing Genius's freedom to compete. Google is supposed to connect people to information. Your corporate values once stood for freedom, 
a platform that let capitalism flourish and helped bring countless people across the globe out of poverty. My question to you, Mr. Pichai, do you think that Google could get away with following China's corporate espionage playbook if you didn't have a monopolistic advantage in the market? Uh, Congressman, uh, I want to be able to address the important uh, concerns you raised. Uh, first of all, we are proud to support the U.S. government. We recently signed a big project with the Department of Defense where we are bringing our world-class, zero-trust-based cybersecurity approach to help protect, protect Pentagon networks uh, from cybersecurity uh, attacks. We have projects underway with the Navy, with Department of Veterans Affairs, happy to follow up and explain more. We have a very limited presence in China. We don't offer any of our services, search, maps, Gmail, YouTube, et cetera, in China. And with respect to music, we license content there. In fact, we license content from other companies. And so this is a dispute between Genius and the other companies in terms of where the source of the content is. But again, happy to engage and explain, uh, explain what we do here further. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Google has received criticism about bias against conservatives and content moderation. There were threats of demonetizing the Federalists and numerous other complaints of viewpoint suppression. As a result, a significant portion of the American public has lost trust in your company. A lack of public confidence in a product usually means there is economic harm to the company. But that just isn't the case with Google. So I think it's a legitimate question as to whether Google's market power insulates it from loss of revenue normally associated with offending half the people who use your product. I also think it's a legitimate question to ask if other attempts to regulate um, your industries have worked. So, Mr. Pichai, Google has restricted advertising analytics or the portability of user data related to advertising due to compliance with the general data protection regulation. Specifically, in 2018, Google restricted the ability to export the double ID, a cookie-based identifier that complies individual user data and creates profiles through Google data transfer. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, not familiar with the specifics of that particular issue, but happy to uh, follow up more once I understand it better. So you're not particularly familiar with how you're complying with GDPR? Uh, Congressman, we, we've long been working to comply with GDPR. We think it's an important regulation, and you know we have uh, we are in full compliance uh, to the extent of my knowledge. Uh, I just meant I'm not aware of that specific issue with the identifier you mentioned there, but happy to understand it better and follow up. All right. So in order to comply with GDPR, Google must retain control over more user data and restrict the ability to combine this user data with other platforms to conduct cross-platform analysis. It seems as if that ultimately limits the ability of advertisers to make comparisons between Google-based campaigns and non-Google-based campaigns. Would you agree with that? Uh, in all these ecosystems, we are, we are balancing between users, advertisers, and publishers. We deeply care about the privacy and security of our users. And so when we serve these ecosystems, we have to take that into account. Uh, we have to comply with important laws and regulations in every country uh, we operate in. And so th that's the delicate balance we are constantly striking. But we are focused on uh, our users and trying to do the best we can. And I, I just want to be perfectly clear. Uh, I I've personally believe that, that just the market power consolidation is significant. But I also want to be clear that when we're moving forward to regulate this, that we aren't actually squeezing out competition in our quest in our, in our quest to do something, because I've, I've said that before in this hearing, and I'll say it again. Usually in our quest to, to regulate big companies, we end up hurting small companies more. And I'm a strong privacy advocate, but the consequences of GDPR have been to further entrench large established actors like Google, leading to regulatory capture that exasperates competition concerns. And Google's digital ad market share has increased since the impl imp implementation of GDPR. Do you know that to be correct? Uh Congressman, uh, to just give you a sense of the robust competition we see, ad prices have fallen down by 40% in the past 10 years. And in fact, in the US, advertising as a share of GDP has come down from 1.4% in 1992, less than 1% today. So we see robust competition in the marketplace. And as I said earlier, you know, we have to comply with regulation. We have to interpret it strictly. 
and we have to balance the ecosystem, but our utmost care is ensuring privacy and security of our users uh, as and we I'm, serve these markets. And I'm glad you mentioned privacy because I would be remiss if I didn't deal with this issue because it is so relevant. And I think generally speaking, outside of the political issues and the bias to solve with all of this, and this is for essentially all four of our witnesses, I think one of our bigger concerns when we talk about data and value and that data having value and privacy, that, which is where people really get concerned with how the digital age is moving forward. And there are news reports that law enforcement has made increasing use of what are called geofence warrants. And these geofence warrants allow authorities to compel technology companies to disclose location records for any device in a certain area at a particular time. Court filings suggest that Google received a 1,500% increase in geof geofence requests from 2017 to 2018 and a 500% increase from 2018 till 2019. Unless, uh, and so the Fourth Amendment requires probable cause and specificity, and that's not what these are. These warrants are essentially for any person in an area at a particular time, and geofence warrants require neither. So unless accompanied by particularized information and identifying a subject, geo warrants are essentially general warrants. I believe that the location information should be considered as contents of the Electronic Communications Act under the Stored Communications Act. Do you agree? Um, you know, happy to understand more. We deeply care about this is why we issued transparency reports because we think it's an important area for Congress to have oversight. And we recently made a change by which we automatically delete uh, uh, location activity after a certain period of time by default for our users. So. We are uh, happy to engage with your office, Congressman, and and and, and, and I'm using more. you because these are going on in Virginia and New York, I think, right now. But I mean, this this equates for everything. I think people would be terrified to know that law enforcement could grab general warrants and get everybody's information anywhere. So it requires Congress to act, and it requires everybody that is a witness in this hearing to be willing to work too, because it is the single most important issue. I think the we're time going of to the do. gentleman has expired. Mr. Pakai, in 2007, Google purchased DoubleClick, the leading provider of certain advertising tools. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Congresswoman. When, Congress per when Google purchased or proposed the merger, alarm bells were raised about the access to data Google would have, specifically the ability to connect a user's personal identity with their browsing activity. Google, however, committed to Congress and to the antitrust enforcers that the deal would not reduce user privacy. Google chief legal advisor testified before the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee that Google wouldn't be able to merge this data even if it wanted to, given contractual restrictions. But in June of 2016, Google went ahead and merged this data anyway, effectively destroying anonymity on the internet. Mr. Pakai, you became CEO in, of Google in 2015, is that correct? Uh, that's right. Okay, and this change was made in 2016, is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you for that. Did you sign off on this decision to combine the sets of data with Google, that Google had told Congress would be uh, kept separate? Con Congresswoman, any, any changes we made? Uh, Ms. We Mr. Made, Mr. You know, Pakai, with all due respect, uh, please, did you sign off on the decision or not? I, I review the, at a high level all the important decisions we make. We deeply care about privacy and security of our users. So you signed off on the decision. user consent for. Okay, okay, you signed off on the decision. Practically, this decision meant that your company would not combine all of, would, would now combine, for example, all of my data on Google, my search history, my location from Google Maps, information from my emails from Gmail, as well as my personal identity with the record of almost all of the websites I visited. That is absolutely staggering. According to an email from a DoubleClick executive, that was exactly the type of reduction in user privacy that Google's founders had previously worried would lead to a backlash. And I quote, they were unwavering on the policy due to philosophical reasons, which is Larry and Sergey's fundamentally not wanting users associated with a cross-site cookie. They were also worried about a privacy storm as well as damage to Google's brand. 
So in 2007, Google's founders feared making this change because they knew it would upset their users. But in 2016, Google didn't seem to care. Mr. Pakai, isn't it true that what changed between 2007 and 2016 is that Google gained enormous market power? So while Google had to care about user privacy in 2007, it no longer had to in 2016. Would you agree that what changed was Google gained enormous market power? Congresswoman, this is an important issue. If I could explain. Well, you know, we today make it very easy for users to be in control of their data. We have simplified their settings. They can turn ads personalization on or off. We have combined most of activity settings into three groupings. Uh, we remind users to go to a privacy checkup. One billion users have okay, done Mr. so. Okay, Mr. Rakai, thank you so much for that. I am concerned that Google's bait and switch with DoubleClick is part of a broader pattern where Google buys up companies for the purposes of surveilling Americans, and because of Google, Google's dominance, users have no choice but to surrender. In 2019, Google made over 80% of its total revenue through selling a ad placement. Is that correct, Mr. Pakai? Uh, you know, About 80%? majority of the business. Yeah, okay. Uh, and because Google sells behavioral ads, ads targeted to each of us as individuals, the more user data that Google collects, the more money Google can make. More user data means more money. Is that correct? Uh, in, in general, that's not true. Uh, for example, when more you come user data, when you type, not the more money the Google we connect, need collects. I'm sorry, please. So you're saying that so, the more user data it does not mean the more money that Google can collect. Congresswoman, most of the data today we collect is to help users uh, and provide personalized experiences back. Ad okay. data Thank you. Is, Thank is you so much, Mr. Pichai. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Pichai, I understand that Google collects user data on users' uh, browsing activity through its Chrome browser. Does Google use that data for its own purposes, either in advertising or to develop and refine its algorithms? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we do use data to improve our products and services for our users. Anytime we do it, we believe in giving users choice, control, and transparency. We make and, it very clear, and we give them simplified settings to choose how they like their data. And, and so you, use, you do use the data that you get from from uh, uh, these companies for your purposes? My, my understanding was whether we use data in general to improve our products and services. And you know we do use data to show ads, but we give users the choice. They can turn ads personalization on or off. Now and this, this, this obviously, the use of this data from all these, from all, from all these companies gives you a tremendous advantage over them and over any competitor. Does the ability to make money in any way affect Google's algorithm in terms of what news appears in a typical user's search results? Uh, the way we rank uh, our search results, you know, we don't take into account a uh, commercial relationship that we have. Okay. Uh, but uh, Facebook and Google uh, have gravely threatened journalism in the United States. Reporters have been fired, local newspapers have been shut down, and now we hear that Google and Facebook are making money over what news the Amer they let the American people see. This is a very dangerous um, uh, uh, situation. Um, and unfortunately, I, my time has expired and I have to yield back. Mr. Pache, I wanted to focus a little bit on Google's acquisition of YouTube and some of the consequences of that move uh, for consumer privacy and competition. Now, Google purchased YouTube in 2006 after identifying it as a potential rival that could eventually draw business away from Google. And it's my understanding Google paid $1.65 billion for that acquisition, nearly 30 times its original bid of $50 million. So could you tell us why Google was willing to pay so much more beyond the initial proposed bid? And was this as a result of any analysis on the harm Google would suffer if a competitor had purchased YouTube? Congresswoman, uh, we acquired YouTube in 2006, and uh, this was well before uh, my my time there as CEO, and I wasn't directly involved. But you know what I do recall 
at the time is that we saw it as a new emerging area and we are mission is to help users with information. We saw an opportunity and it wasn't was, clear. YouTube only had 67 people. Okay, we was Mr. Page in charge of that decision? Uh, Congresswoman, well, I wasn't directly know. involved, but okay. I'm pretty sure our senior leadership team at that time uh, okay. definitely looked into it. Okay, we, we, I would encourage the subcommittee to take the steps necessary to um, have us hear from whoever was in charge of that. Uh, moving on, uh, Google is now by far the top online site where Americans watch videos, including children's videos. And as I'm sure you're aware, federal law prevents companies from collecting data on children under 13. However, just last year, the Federal Trade Commission found that Google had spent years knowingly collecting data on children under 13 on YouTube and offering advertisers the ability to target those children directly. Uh, Mr. Pichet, did YouTube use the data it illegally acquired to improve its ability to target ads to children? We are, uh, you know, we are, this is an area, uh, you know, I take it very seriously. I'm a parent too. We are committed. We have invested tremendously. We have a dedicated product for kids in YouTube kids on the main YouTube platform. We make sure we have clear policies. We enforce them rigorously. Just in Q4 of 2019, we flagged and removed uh, almost close to a million videos, uh, potentially for concerns around child safety. So it's an area we are investing uh, uh, rigorously and, and okay. will continue to do so. Well, I'm more concerned about the fact that you're investing rigorously in luring in advertisers like toy makers, Mattel and Hasbro by telling them that YouTube is the number one website regularly visited by kids. So that sounds like you're targeting the kids and then targeting advertisers to to bring them on board. Um, it, is that correct? Uh, today, in the main site of YouTube, uh, we don't allow anyone under 13 to create accounts. There are scenarios in which there could be family viewing, and, and today there are creators who create content uh, oriented towards families, and, and as part of that, there are advertisers which are interested in connecting with those users. Okay. But everything we do here, uh, we obviously comply with uh, all the uh, all the applicable regulations. And, okay, well and let's look at some of the some of the content that is specifically for children. Um, Copa um, makes it um, illegal to um, target those kids, but but we've got an issue where content creators are in a very difficult position now. So if a show like Sesame Street doesn't want to show ads for junk food on YouTube, does YouTube allow it to make that choice? Uh, Today we we do you know we we have uh, choices both for creators uh, in terms of uh, you know tools and preferences and we have extensive uh, tools for advertisers and above all for users we give a choice they can e either use YouTube as a subscription service uh, without seeing those types of ads or uh, you know they can use it for free with ads so we give choice and and you know for us it is of utmost importance that YouTube is a place where people come to learn. And you know, we find increasingly small and medium businesses use YouTube to thrive, especially even during COVID, uh, particularly okay. many, well, many businesses. Let's go back to who, content that's designed for children. So you know, if there's an organization like Sesame Street that wants to provide child-centered content, but they don't want that content to be sullied, shall we say, with junk food ads or something, my understanding is that you say that the content creators can do that, but we've got a recent report from the Wall Street Journal that says YouTube hasn't been honoring those requests, and it's been making it difficult for independent auditing companies like Open Slate to independently audit that and then report back to those content creators about whether or not YouTube is, is honoring those. Is that correct? I'm not familiar with the particular report, but I'm happy to uh, understand it better and you know have my office follow up with your staff, Congresswoman. I would appreciate that, and my time has expired. I yield back. Mr. Pichai, um, I direct my questions to you. Many of us feel a deep urgency to protect independent journalism, and I wanted to talk a little bit about ad revenue and independent journalism. Google makes most of its revenue through selling advertising, and Google's advertising exchange is a, quote, real-time marketplace to buy and sell display advertising space. Correct? Uh, yes, Congressman, that's correct. And over 2 million websites, including online newspapers, use that exchange, correct? If we have 
very proud to support publishers, and uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but. Yes, that okay. seems to well, that's, that's an estimate put forth by tech expert Dina Srinivasan. Um, and your own website for Google Display Network says you have access to over 2 million sites. What is Google's share of the ad exchange market? Congressman, uh, I'm not exactly familiar. I've seen various, uh, various reports, but uh, okay. you know, we, let, we are a popular choice. Great. Let me put it up for you. If you look at the screen, you will see that um, 50 to 60 percent, Google has 50 to 60 percent, according to the online platforms and digital advertising CMA market study that was just released. Um, and in order to buy and sell on these exchanges, websites and advertisers go through a middleman like Google's DV360 and Google Ads. Uh, if you look at the slide, Mr. Pichai, you can see that the share of this buy side market that Google has is 50 to 90 percent, according to the same study. Um, and I just want to simplify how these exchanges work. So say in Seattle, Dee's Electronics, a mom and pop business, wants to buy online ad space in the Seattle Times. Dee's Electronics would need to go to a middleman like Google Ads, which would then bid for ad space on an ad exchange. The problem is that Google controls all of these entities. So it's running the marketplace, it's acting on the buy side, and it's acting on the sell side at the same time, which is a major conflict of interest. It allows you to set rates very low as a buyer of ad space from newspapers, depriving them of their ad revenue, and then also to sell high to small businesses who are very dependent on advertising on your platform. It sounds a bit like a stock market. Except, unlike a stock market, there's no regulation on your ad exchange market. If there were regulation, it would actually prohibit insider trading, which means that the broker can't use the data in the broker division to buy and sell for their own interests. Instead, brokers have to serve the clients, their clients. Does Google have a similar obligation to serve its clients, the businesses that are selling and buying ad space? Congresswoman, if I could explain this for a minute, uh, we paid over $14 billion to publishers. We are deeply committed to journalism in this area. On an, on an average, we pay out 69% of the revenue when publishers use Google's buy and I, I, uh, sell side tools. And you know, out of it, it's a low margin business for us. We do it because we want to help support right. publishers in no, this area. I, I understand that, Mr. Pichai. What I'm trying to get at is when any company controls the buy and the sell side, I worked on Wall Street a very long time ago, there are reasons that insider trading is regulated, and this ad exchange is essentially the same thing, and without accountability, it isn't meaningful to just care about the newspapers. We're seeing them die all over, and ad revenue is a big reason. Let me put up a graph here that shows that Google's ad revenue is increasingly coming from ads on Google-owned sites and less so from other websites. Can you explain that trend? Um, I can't quite see whether this is net revenue or gross revenue. Obviously, when it comes to non-Google properties, we share the majority of revenue back to publishers, whereas on our own properties, we obviously, you know, we, are, we have the inventory. So, but I would need to understand more. I just quickly looked at it. I, okay. I'm not sure I fully we, we can grasp, send it. But. We can send it to you and make sure you have it. Um, you know, Google has not made its search traffic volumes public in years, so there's no way for us to know uh, exactly what's happening here. And there's no way for businesses to verify whether they've been treated fairly or left behind in favor of Google-owned companies. Is Google steering advertising revenue to Google Search? Uh, Congresswoman, users come to Google search. Uh, it is that traffic, and you know that's where uh, our source of revenue comes from. So we are focused on providing users the information they are looking for. We work hard to earn their trust. We know competition for information is just a click hey, away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pichai. Um, I, I just want to make the point uh, that independent journalism is incredibly necessary to our democracy, and we want to do what we can to protect it. Mr. Pichai, similarly, there was an article just today, or excuse me, yesterday, uh, about from The Verge. The title is, Google reportedly keeps tabs on usage of rival Android apps to develop competitors. And I'll quote from the article, Google said that the data doesn't give information about how people behave while they're using individual apps, but it wouldn't say whether it had been used to develop competing apps. So I guess first, I take it you would confirm 
uh, that Google does have access to confidential information or um, ultimately competitively sensitive information about apps on the Android devices? Uh, Congressman, if I could clarify this. Today, uh, we have an API which is available for other developers as long as users consent. This gives us system health metrics. This is how we can launch digital well-being features on Android. This is how we understand which apps are using battery and we can give a dashboard uh, which shows, uh, you know, maybe for crashing or quality control or for battery usage or for digital well-being. So at a high level, this data uh, is available through a public API and other developers can avail as long as the users give consent to it. So, Mr. Pichai, I just want to clarify, uh, again, I'll quote from this article. The article refers to this data as sensitive data about other apps, including how often they've, they're opened and for how long they're used. I'm not asking how you use that information. I'm just asking whether or not, in fact, the, what the article alleges it is correct, that you do have access to that data. Uh, yeah, with the with the with user consent and the APIs exist. Yes, we do. And does Google use and it's that? critical for us to have access to that so that we can maintain the, you know, this is how we understand and we can, uh, you know, improve research uh, resource usage of applications. Understood. We can have features like. Uh, my time's limited. Sorry, I, I, I just want to get to this core question. Given that Google does have access to that data, does Google use that data to develop competing apps? And if your answer is no. Uh, will Google commit to making the necessary changes within its Android developer uh, app agreements uh, to ensure uh, that developers have that sense of clarity, that in fact the data will not be used for Google to be able to develop a competing application? Congressman, like other businesses today, we do look at trends and, you know, we in fact in Play Store we do publish the number of installs of uh, application and we give ranges and so there's a wide variety of way by which we try to understand what's happening in the market. But I uh, appreciate your uh, concern about making sure there's clarity in this area and we'll continue to invest and give more clarity. Yeah, I just, I, I must, in, I guess, want to just follow very quickly, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, if you're willing. So I guess I'm wondering if you can just a answer that fundamental question. Does Google use that information to develop competing apps? I understand the, the purposes you've described, in terms of how you use the information. I'm just asking if one of those, in fact, is yeah. to develop competing apps. The gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Um, Congressman, because we try to understand what's going on in market and we are aware of, uh, you know, popularity of apps, you know, I don't want to, uh, I want to be accurate in my answer, but in general, uh, the primary use for that data is to improve the health of Android, but, uh, you know, and. Any, any data we get, we have user consent for it, and we make it available through an API to other developers as well. The gentleman's time has expired. The men are named Zuckerberg, Cook, Pichai, and Bezos. Once again, they control their control of the marketplace allows them to do whatever it takes to crush independent business and expand their own power. This must end. This subcommittee will next publish a report on the findings of our investigation we will propose solutions to the problems before us.